go. <clears throat> Good evening, everyone. Uh, the time having arrived, I am calling to order this public hearing on school choice. I'm going to use my glasses to make sure I do everything procedurally correct. Uh, let's see where I'm going to start. Chapter 76, Section 12B of the Mass General Laws as amended by the Education Reform Act of 1993 and subsequent legislation <clears throat> provides for a statewide school choice program. The law requires each school committee in the state to admit students from other districts under the school choice program unless there is a vote to withdraw from the program by June 1st of each year. Prior to such a vote, there must be a public hearing on the issue of whether or not to participate in school choice. What's occurring right now is the actual public hearing, and I will now open the hearing. We can hear from the public, we can have some discussion amongst the members, no vote will be taken. The vote on school choice will actually occur later this evening as a regular agenda item as part of tonight's formal school committee meeting. But as I just read, the law requires that before the school committee considers withdrawing from school choice, that there has to be a public hearing. And so that's what uh, this is right now. Let me read one short paragraph here. Um, the public hearing is now for members of the committee, most of whom were not here last year. Last year, the school committee voted to continue the following program. Up to 50 seats will be available for inter-district students at Brockton High School and up to 10 students in the Edison Academy. Um, so going back, I served four years in the school committee. It's my third year as mayor. So this is the seventh year the school committee has consistently approved this formula each year. And to the best of my knowledge, there's never been any negative uh, feedback from the administration in terms of it creating any issues. 50, 50 spots in a school that's got over 4,000 students is an extremely small percentage. And I don't think we ever have the 50. Um, but I do think it, would, it sends the wrong message if we're not willing to admit some under certain circumstances. And it also helps us to recoup some of the money that we lose when Brockton students use school choice to go to school in other districts and we have to send the reimbursement the other direction. I think it's about 30 students that we have currently in the school choice program uh, altogether. So at this time, is there anyone from the public that would like to be heard on school choice? Okay, I'll call that part of the meeting. That part of the hearing is closed. Uh, now we'll have, we can have discussion amongst members of the school committee. No vote but discussion. Would any member like to be heard on school choice? Mr. Gormley. Um, Mr. Um, He's the acting superintendent. If you don't think so, just ask him. <laughs> <laughs> Six. Six. Six total. Six at Edison, um, 24 at Brockton High. Um, there's one in the ninth grade at the high school, five in the 10th grade, seven in the 11th grade, and 11 in the 12th grade that, for Brockton High. I do, I do not know the breakup of, you know, Edison, they're not um, categorized as freshmen, sophomores, juniors, or seniors. So probably I would guess that six, those six, probably half are in their last year of Edison and maybe the other have a year left. That me? Stop moving. <laughs> and anyone else for the discussion? Is that really me? No. Why? Wait, 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 we just the time already. Three minutes? Just kidding. Any further? Mr. Dagasino. Sure. Is there any negative side of having approving this? I think that in the early years of school choice there was some concern expressed by parents that if we had an influx of too many students 
it might somehow deny opportunities to Brockton kids. And that was why years ago the school committee put the limit of 50, feeling that in a school of nearly 4,500, 50 is not going to have any impact. Theoretically, those bodies are sprinkled around in different classes and actually helps us generate a little revenue and, and doesn't have any impact. So, as I say, for the seven years that I've been here, I've never received any negative feedback ever about the presence of school choice. Okay, thank you. Mr. Gorman. Yeah. 820. And that, that includes the numbers to Southeastern. Oh, okay. We don't have, we have a breakdown of how many Southeastern students are in. No, that's, but it's usually between five and six. Yeah. Abroad. My guess would be, yeah, right. Usually five and six. We have a, uh, yeah. So that includes the FBI. That includes, yeah, all 822. Yeah. That includes, like, the Foxborough, any charter school, Spelman, um, you know, any other private school students choose to go to. And, again, I, I think it's usually between five and 600 for Southeastern. Yeah. So that's all in that 822 number. It's a substantial amount of money that we lose. The, the school choice tuitions are lumped in with the charter school tuitions and it's all deducted off our chapter 70 number before it even comes through the city side. So when that chapter 70 number comes over to you guys, it's already net the deduction for all the school choice students and all the charter school tuitions. That's why you don't see the adjustment. Yes. Anyone else? All right, I'll entertain a motion to adjourn the public hearing. Motion has been made. Second, Mr. D'Agostino, all in favor? This public hearing on school choice is hereby adjourned. We had a good conversation over here. <laughs> the time having arrived, I call this meeting of the Brockton School Committee to order and ask you to please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Now we open each school committee meeting with hearing of visitors. So as we have several signed in to be heard this evening, let me just go over the ground rules real quickly. Uh, any member of the public uh, may sign up for hearing of visitors to address uh, the superintendent, the school committee, and the mayor. There is a three-minute time limit on your remarks, and we ask you to please honor that as we have several people that would like to speak. Uh, but you can use up to three minutes. There is no response from the school committee. All matters are taken under <coughs> advisement. So everyone will listen very carefully and consider your comments, but there is, there is no two-way dialogue. It's uh, everything is taken under advisement. And I will call the speakers in the order that they signed in. So our first speaker is Ryan Hamlet. Ryan, how are you? Good to see you. you Long time, huh? Yes. <laughs> yep, thank you. One for the superintendent. Thank you. Ryan, whenever you're ready, you have the floor. Thank you, uh, Mayor, Mayor Bill Carpenter, Deputy Superintendent, and members of the school committee for letting me speak here tonight to you regarding some serious concerns that I and many of my fellow teachers have. First and foremost, I would like, especially like to thank Brett Gormley for standing up for teachers at the last budget meeting. I know it truly meant a lot to myself and many of my colleagues. Over the last couple of months, our city has bonded together over Brockton Kids Count. I, like many of the teachers of the city, embrace this slogan on a daily basis. 
We go above and beyond for each of our students, and our job doesn't end there. We go to sporting events and performances. We work night school, extended day, and coach. It's because we support our stu students each and every day. It's with great sadness I sit before you tonight. Last year we lost 60 dedicated teachers, and if it stands, we will lose another 59 this year. If this happens, class sizes will reach 35 to 40 students, and this will have a drastic impact on our students. They will not be able to receive the attention they deserve. I would like to now share with you a couple of stories from my students that I had last year at the Raymond and my current students at the Pluff. If you could do me a favor and close your eyes. Imagine you're a first year teacher, not even a month and a half into the school year. Everything in your life is flipped upside down. Your biggest supporter, your mother, passes away. All she ever wanted was to see you succeed and make a difference in the lives of your students. Then you receive a text message from a fellow teacher with the following letter. It is from one of your students who moved away while you were out and you will never see again. Dear Mr. H, thank you so much for everything you have done for me so far this year. I started off this year with poor quiz grades, but then you helped me bring them back up. No other math teacher has believed in me the way you've believed in me. I never thought until the end would end so soon. I'm leaving behind friends and most importantly, teachers who care about me. Anyways, thank you. Remember, don't give up, don't ever give up. Love, Chris Brown. Hashtag, Chris Brown counts. Thank you for never giving up on me. When I was struggling, you were always there. And I believe because of you, I am no longer getting straight C's in math. Hashtag, hashtag, Ariana Wold Grover counts. Last week was definitely a trying time for myself and many of my colleagues. One of the things that helped me through was one of my students inviting me to our church's teachers and coaches appreciation service. She and other students from the church group got up and said some kind words about their teachers. As I was talking to her mother afterwards, pink slips were brought up. This had a huge effect on me because last year I was laid off. I was offered jobs in other districts, but I felt I belonged in Brockton because I'm a lifetime Brocktonian. I toughed it out, became the long-term sub, and eventually was hired back at the end of October. The mother I was speaking to felt awful and asked if there was anything she can do. I asked her to keep the hope. I never in a million years would have thought she would do what she did. She had her daughter and her friends write, write letters on my behalf and what meaningful teachers mean to them. He is such a dedicated teacher and is willing to help with anything. He inspired me to pursue my talents and enjoy life for what it is. He encouraged me in everything I did and inspired me to be my very best. Hashtag Allie Winkler counts. We have been a very difficult class, but he has never given up on us. Mr. H actually cares for his students, not just about our test scores, but about our well-being. Hashtag Ruby Politano counts. Before him, I didn't like math because I thought it was confusing and hard. Then I met Mr. Hamlet. He came and opened my eyes to the world of problem solving. Hashtag Malia Hunter counts. I'd be lying if I sat here saying I'm not concerned about myself and fellow teachers that are going to be affected by these cuts. A majority of us will land in other districts, and that's all well and good. The real effect is in Brockton and its students. We continue to lose quality teachers and ask the remaining teachers to do more with less. The students I read about and thousands of others will need our, will, and thousands of others who need our help will fall by the wayside. As I drive around the city, I see thousands of signs, bumper stickers, and billboards stating, Brockton kids count, including every school in this district, and three just driving into Brockton High tonight. How as a district can we truly live with ourselves saying Brockton kids count, and then have this done to them? Come September, the only thing these kids will be counting is the number of kids in their classroom. Thank you for your time, and Brockton teachers count. I gave you a little over on the time, Ryan, because I could tell you put a lot of work into your presentation. I didn't want to interrupt you. Um, our next uh, visitor that would like to be heard is Joanna Schnitz. Good evening, Mayor Carpenter, 
forgive my voice, sorry. Um, good evening, Deputy Superintendent Thomas, and good evening, members of the school committee. Thank you for listening to us this fine evening. My name is Johanna Schnitz, and I have worked in the English department at Brockton High School for four of my past 11 years teaching. This is the third time I have been laid off here. I know you have very difficult decisions to make, that you have already made very difficult decisions. It is for this reason that I have not come in the past years to speak to you, because I know your cho choices are hard, and I don't know how to tell you which ones to make. But what I do know is the range of nuances that teachers and student students navigate together in the classroom each day. Subsequently, I know a reduction in staff means greater challenges for students and teachers alike in regards to both academics and social and emotional development, something so very important beyond academics. Fewer licensed and experienced staff in the classroom will result in less innovation and collaboration. Naturally, this is inevitable where fewer minds meet. With more students in the classroom, this will also mean less personalized academic attention and less support for an, a range of social emotional needs that our students come with. Adolescents have a hard enough time just being adolescents, and now they're growing up with so many other issues they have to deal with on a daily basis. Finding personalized support for them is a challenge. You had good intentions last year in creating a day with more class choices and smaller class sizes in next year's schedule. But reductions in force completely undo that invaluable work. Small class sizes are important to all grade levels, not just kindergartens. Though we all wish teachers were superhuman, teachers are not. And with more students in the classroom, more patience is needed, and there is not always more patience to give. This will lead to more instructional stalls, disciplinary issues, and greater difficulties following Chapter 222. Finally, if these were not problematic enough, join me in my classroom, in a co-taught classroom, where I teach my juniors, in which approximately half of them are on individualized education plans, or 504s, for ADHD, autism spectrum disorders, problems with executive functioning, impulse control issues, dyslexia, dyscalculia, hearing and vision impairments, and countless other learning and cognitive disabilities. Then add in a handful of students who are taking this class as their first mainstream English class, along with general education students. They're already in a class of 30, which is far too much. Now put them in a class of 35 to 40. With few fewer teachers and larger class sizes, how much harder do we think we can make the challenge of teaching and learning before we realize the outcomes we desire are impossible to achieve? I beg of you, please reconsider the tremendous resources you have and the teachers who are laid off. We want to be in that room. The students need us in that room. Please let each of us return to our rooms next year. Thank you very much. Our next uh, visitor to speak is Sue Doherty. <clears throat> Good evening and thank you, uh, Mayor Carpenter, Deputy Superintendent Thomas, and the school committee for hearing me tonight. <coughs> um, I'm here to speak about um, school librarians and I, I understand the challenge with the class sizes and wanting to keep uh, as many teachers as possible and I was told today that the decision was to eliminate all support staff and so we're seen as a support role because we don't have actual classes that we teach on a day-to-day -day basis and give um, grades to. But um, we do a lot that people don't see to 
not just support the classroom teacher, but actually we do teach as well. Um, we do take a lot of students. Sometimes I'll have up to, I'm just kind of, you know, just adding this to the beginning, but because I was thinking about what the teachers was saying about the class size, um, up to 50 or more students in the IRC by myself when teachers are absent without a sub or kids coming down from study. And, and that's a lot of the time. I, I've actually had more than 60 at a time, but um, I had to cut it down to about 45 to 50 because 60 began, began to feel a little unmanageable. So although people don't see us with a roster and with report cards, we are teaching all day in the IRCs and the libraries. So um, that said, um, I was shocked to hear that the Brockton Public Schools were planning to eliminate all the school librarians. Last year, we had seven left and five were eliminated. And this year, the last two are being, um, I was given a blue slip, which I used to teach English, so I'd be transferred back to English. And my colleague was given a pink slip, and we we're t being told that Brockton Public Schools will no longer have librarians. And um, so this isn't about me or my job because um, I, I, my days are over as a librarian for Brockton Public Schools. I'm not on the library list. I'm actually speaking for the kids, not for me, okay? Um, so it's really about the loss of libraries, too, that comes with the loss of librarians. If you think about it, a doctor's office isn't a, doc isn't a doctor's office really without a doctor. You may have other people working there. You would have uh, some clerks maybe when you go in, or secretaries. You might see a... Um, you might see a, a nurse practitioner for minor issues, but if you are really having a, an issue, you'll like to know that there's a doctor at the doctor's office. Well, I kind of think that's how we are, and people don't really understand that. They do tend to think anyone who works in the library is a librarian, but you know, we have, I have two master's degrees, and one is in school library, um, the other is in um, uh, secondary education. I have a bachelor's in English, so I have a gr good body of knowledge to go with my um, position. And you know, all school librarians do, all certified ones. So that's one issue um, that I think is important to remember. You know, with the, uh, if a student's really stuck on a research project for IB, for AP, for um, National History Day, the teachers will send them to us and they'll say, you know, go see Ms. Doherty because the teacher's been trying to find stuff and they can't uh, find it, but I can, they know I can. Um, I can reach out to my colleagues in the National Archives. I can reach out to uh, my colleagues in the Massachusetts School Library Association. If we're having trouble finding a resource, the librarians love to look for stuff. So all I have to do is call or write to another librarian and somebody will come back to me with something and that'll get to the kids. So uh, that's something just to keep in mind. So we do teach. We're not just standing behind a desk. We, we do a lot more than that. Um, we also maintain and curate a collection of core academic resources both print and digital that are used on a daily basis. We even have at the high school uh, yearbooks that are locked up safely going back to 1908. I was told when I took this position that I was now the keeper of the yearbooks and I needed to take that very seriously. These need to be kept under lock and key. You don't let them go out uh, because it's a, pri it's a uh, prized resource uh, that we have. Uh, we and we also go all the way up to the Commonwealth eBook collection that uh, lives online and it's updated late, da daily. And those are eBooks, we just got that this year. That comes through our association with the Massachusetts Library System, which we're eligible for because we have certified librarians. We will lose access to those kind of resources because they ask us to give an updated license to them every single year. They want to see that there are librarians there to promote the resources so that they get used. And if there's a problem, we're the ones that, connect, that contact them to make sure that the issues are being taken care of. This, earlier this year, we were having trouble with the databases because there was something that happened downtown. They changed the IP address, and I had to you know, go back and forth with the people at the Massachusetts Library System to make sure we got those back up online so that students and teachers could use them. Um, if you, do you guys have a timer? You're All right. Am I over? All right, I'm going to stop. I'll, I'll stop there because I, I didn't practice, so I don't want to go on and on. I just want to, so I'll just wrap up right now and say, um, and, and the, speaking of that, the databases, we would lose access to those as well. Another thing to think about is NEASC. Um, you know, NEASC looks for libraries, uh, librarians. Um, IB, last year when the IB came to review us, um, they actually wanted to interview me. They, that was part of the report with the um, International Baccalaureate. I'm, I'm a, a trained IB librarian. If I'm not there, someone else could get it. But the thing is that there are, there are, there are ramifications. I, I know we are seen as support staff, but I just wanted to put that across. And I think the Brockton students deserve a librarian. Um, the wealthy communities are putting lots of money into their libraries, learning commons, and thing, all kinds of things like that. I mean, I hate to think that we, you know, we can't even save one librarian. That's all I'm asking. Just try to save one, one position, one librarian. Thank you. Uh, 
Our next speaker is Britt Sorensen. Good evening. Um, I would also like to speak about libraries and technology. My name is Britt Sorensen. I've been a teacher in Brockton for 16 years. Three years ago, the school committee approved plans to dismantle the computer lab at North Middle School and replace it with a wireless technology center in the library. This was quite an enormous task, which involved a complete renovation of the library, it involved technology department, facilities department, um, technology, library, everyone working together as a team. As a licensed librarian who was working in the computer lab at the time, I dutifully did the work asked of me by administration and the school committee. I trained students and teachers how to apply technology skills on a diverse range of subjects. I also frequently resolved technical problems and purchased needed items, such as headphones and mice with my own money. Because there was no budget for books at the school, I fundraised over $5,000, which was used for the library. Because I am a certified librarian, I was also able to register North Middle School with the Massachusetts library system, allowing students access to the state databases and free online encyclopedias, resources which normally cost thousands of dollars. By cutting my position and placing me in a third grade classroom, I believe the city has made an expensive decision. I'm no longer in a position to use the training that the city has paid for, and I no longer work in the facility that I worked so hard to create. I put many hours of work, unpaid, my own funds, into updating the technology at North Middle School, and I think that having that work cut off so soon, as soon as it was completed, um, is maybe not necessarily saving as much money as it might appear. Um, at the last budget meeting, it was discussed technology updating the training needed for teachers and staff, and I was in a position to do that at North. I'm no longer in that type of a position. Um, I would just like to recommend that the school committee think about utilizing the skills um, the, of the librarians in terms of training people for technology, in terms of being leaders in technology, um, as opposed to completely eliminating the positions. Thank you. All right, that completes the list of speakers who signed up for hearing of visitors. We'll now go on to the consent agenda. The consent agenda is the portion of the meeting where uh, the school committee considers a block of routine matters as one item to help uh, expedite the meeting and keep it moving along. However, any member of the school committee can request that any individual item or items be removed from the consent agenda for individual discussion and consideration. So at this time, I'll ask, uh, are there any members of the school committee <laughs> who would like to request withdrawing any items from the consent agenda? Okay, seeing none, I'll entertain a motion on the consent agenda. On the consent agenda. Okay, motion made, properly seconded by Mr. Gormley. All in favor? Opposed? The consent agenda passes unanimously. Uh, at this uh, part of the meeting now, uh, we turn it over to the superintendent of schools, in this case the deputy superintendent of schools, uh, for the report on teaching and learning. Thank you, Mayor. Um, tonight we do not have a, a Brockton High School student rep with us, so um, we will uh, skip over that part, and we have um, the unknown school here. Uh, Colleen Proudler and her, Principal Proudler and her team are here to do an update um, and a presentation to you about the unknown school. Good evening. Good evening. 
Um, I'm Colleen Prowler, principal of the Arnon School, and I'm here to speak with you this evening about an exciting professional development opportunity that we had this year called the Reader's Workshop Model. I've brought with me my ELS, Jackie Abrams, first grade teacher, Alicia Silipino, and fourth grade teacher, Denise Fumicello, all of whom will be helping me with this presentation. Um, this opportunity was a unique opportunity for us to have this year, and um, as we talk about it this evening, there's three things that I'd actually like you to know about the Reader's Workshop model. The first is I'd like to explain a little bit about what it is and why it was a good opportunity for children. The second piece that I'd like to share with you is how I'll um, show you how it was a wonderful professional development opportunity for our teachers. Mrs. Silipino and Ms. Fumicello are exemplary teachers, and this was an excellent opportunity for them to improve their practice and really think about what's happening in their classroom. And the third point that I'd like to make this evening about this professional development opportunity that we embarked upon is that it was also very beneficial for our ELS, Mrs. Abrams. It also provided her with a different type of professional development and has allowed her to take this training, work with other teachers in other classrooms, and then grow the model throughout the building. The Reader's Workshop model is something that we have been learning about in conjunction with the Teacher Teaching Learning Alliance, we call it TLA, which is a nonprofit organization that supports over 150 urban, suburban, and rural school districts since 1990. There's three schools in Brockton that were lucky enough to participate in this initiative, the Angelo School, the Downey, and ourselves. This opportunity was actually funded by Title IIA, which is a grant for professional development, and the, the TLA in, you know, I'm sorry, utilizes job embedded instructional coaching and lab classrooms to drive instructional improvement from within each individual classroom and school. And I do need to thank uh, Karen McCarthy, Dr. Julian Andrade, and Mrs. June Saber McGuire for allowing us to be a part of this really exciting initiative because they are the ones who brought it to us. We didn't find it. So as we get going, what is a lab classroom? A lab classroom is actually a classroom in which the teacher, in this case Ms. Fumicello and Mrs. Silipino, have agreed to participate in a professional development opportunity in real time in their current classroom. The teacher receives coaching within the classroom and they agree to open up their practice to be observed by others. Those others include teachers, administrators, the TLA consultants, and the elementary literacy specialists from my building as well as from other buildings around the city all have the opportunity to visit the classroom during a hosted lab visit. They have an opportunity to see the consultants working in the classroom with these children. They have the opportunity to see the classroom teachers working with the children. And then there's some feedback and some discussion that occurs around that. As far as the structure of Reader's Workshop, there's three main components to it. There are mini lessons. So the, the lesson begins with a mini lesson, which focuses on some aspect of literature or reading strategy. There is independent reading time, where students keep a journal and respond to literature in terms of what they think or how they feel about what they're reading. And during independent reading time, the teacher will engage in student conferences on an individual or a group basis. Teachers can also engage in guided reading with groups of students who need additional support. Finally, there's sharing time where the students come back together and they share with another person their journal entries and another person gives feedback. I'm actually going to have Mrs. Silipino and Mrs. Ms. Fumicello discuss with you the various components in a little bit more depth. So at first when we were learning about Reader's Workshop, we were introduced to new expectations, a whole brand new routine that we had to implement into our classroom. We started this in February, um, so we already had very predictable structured routines. So this was new for our kids and they did really well with this. Um, during the mini lessons, that's a short lesson with a narrow focus that provides instruction on a skill or concept. Ideally, a mini lesson is 10 to 15 minutes, 15 minutes top. And during that time, um, 
kids have assigned seats so it makes the transitions very quick and quiet um, they have assigned seats they listen with their whole body you know you know the wiggling I'm a first grade teacher so I have lots of wiggling going on in my room um, so you train them in all these routines and practices so you are able um, to keep this model going the mini lesson is the eyes are on the teacher the teacher brings a connection yesterday when we did this we learned about and you work on things that are your students are currently working on um, so you have that connection you introduce what you're going to teach that day and why you're teaching it why is it important why do I need to teach you this why is this a strategy that you need to use when you're reading um, so you do that and your modeling, I'm holding my hand up because I use, we use books. <laughs> um, so you're modeling what's going on in your head as a reader. You're thinking out loud, you're asking questions, but you need to train your students. I don't want you to yell out the answers to these questions. This is my brain and what's going on as I'm working. So they, as a reader, can start thinking about what's going on in their head as they're reading a story. Um, so you do the lesson, then you let them try. They do a turn and talk. You can walk through and listen. Then you go back. You might say, oh, I heard so and so. Uh, you wouldn't say a name, but I heard this and I heard this. Now I want you to go off and do this, practice this on your own. When you read today and when you read every day, you're going to do this. So then the kids would break off and they would go to their independent reading spots again with transitions being quick they go get their books they go to the reading spot and then that brings in the time when the teachers can do conferences so one part of the mini lesson that's been huge for me especially um, I'm not very artistic or creative so creating anchor charts was always a tough thing for me to grasp because it, I'm a perfectionist, so I always wanted it to look pretty and colorful and not any mistakes, and I wanted the kids to be engaged. Um, so Alicia and I have really done a nice job of um, working together. Even though she's first grade and I'm fourth grade, there are still a lot of skills that I teach every day that they began first in first grade. Um, so anchor charts is a huge part of the mini lesson, um, and it's a great way to keep the, the students engaged, especially in first grade, but um, surprisingly in fourth grade as well. Um, I thought that they wouldn't really pay attention to the boards, but when I unveil the chart, it's like, ooh, ah, they are amazed with you know what's on there. Um, and at first, I had a tough time understanding the concept of it because I normally would create a chart like this with the students in front of me, so that they felt that they were part of it. Um, but as we had learned from our coach, um, uh, most of it is constructed before the kids sit down, but then as they participate and they have the opportunity to try the skill you're doing with them, they can, um, you know, give you answers to write down, they can use post-it notes, come up and stick them on the board, um, and that keeps them engaged um, and interested. So that's a huge part um, of the mini lesson that I wanted to add in. So these are just a couple examples of some anchor charts that we've created. Um, a, Mrs. Silpino has really enjoyed giving her first grade students the charts to go home and take home with them. Um, and I know in the fourth grade classroom it is a competition as to who gets to take the charts home. Um, but but yes. So for the independent reading, I have to say in my classroom, this is the one thing that I have seen the biggest improvement on. In the beginning of the year when it was, you know, let's take 15, 20 minutes and read quietly, I get the oh, the, oh, the moans and the groans. Um, you know, I'd have students that say, I don't have a book, or I already finished this book, or I don't like this book. Um, a huge part of the independent reading is having the students they get to pick their own books. Um, so essentially, the, each student has a book bag. Um, and in their book bag, they keep it in their desk. And they are uh, supposed to have about five to six books in the book bag. In that book bag, they should have a variety of books to choose from. Nonfiction, fiction, um, some chapter books, some picture books, more ch uh, chapter books in fourth grade um, as opposed to first grade. So um, when we observe in each other's classrooms, I'll look at her kids' book bags, and I'm like, whoa, these are much different than my fourth graders, <laughs> and vice versa. Um, but the students really enjoy the fact of getting to choose their own books. Um, unfortunately, the books come from my classroom library, so that was you know, an improvement as well that needed to happen as, as well in Ms. Lupino's classroom of improving the library to not only gear their interests, but their, you know, the correct levels. 
Um, you know, I've only been teaching a few years in Brockton, so at the very beginning, I had no classroom library, so it was a lot of hand-me-downs from other teachers that had passed on things. And as the years went on, I realized that these aren't really interesting enough for these students anymore. Their interests change. Um, so that was something that we both had to work on was updating our libraries, which, of course, is never cheap, unfortunately. <laughs> um, but the students really enjoy um, choosing a book. So they, my students in the fourth grade, they read about 25, 30 minutes. We started with 15, 20, and we've progressed as the year has gone on. They've built up stamina. Um, while they're reading independently, they get to choose a quiet spot in the classroom. Um, read quietly while they're reading. I will either conference with one on one, one, one student one on one for about seven or eight minutes. And then as we've progressed in the model, we've been practicing pulling strategy groups. So before I started this model in my specific classroom, my, cl my students would be in ELA centers. They would do you know, reading, writing, grammar skills, all the above. And when they were in centers, I would pull students that were all on the same reading level. And I would work on you know, certain skills and in different types of books, but the students were all at the same level. The difference is with this is these students don't necessarily have to be at the same reading level. They all have to be focusing on a certain skill that they all are struggling in. So it's very nice to see the students, they like to see different books at the table because they also get to see, oh, I haven't read that book yet. When I get to a better level, maybe I'll be able to read that. Um, so that keeps them engaged and interested. Um, and that's a huge part. I, so I, I thoroughly enjoy seeing the skills that they work on, not necessarily, <coughs> oh, all the kids are at the same level. They're all focusing on the same things, but they understand that punctuation is important even in the easier books, but it's just as important in the tougher books as well. Mm -hmm. And I also want to say that this, uh, I've really enjoyed being a lab classroom. It served as a learning environment for both the teachers and the students. And the students were very, very excited about helping teachers learn. Um, we got to try out these new instructional te um, techniques in a risk-free environment with safe, safe learning. We didn't feel like we were being judged. Everyone was very helpful. After our lessons, we always met as a whole group and discussed it. Um, the coaches in an administrative team and our TLA consultants uh, were able to help us reflect on our lessons. They helped us recognize our strengths and weaknesses um, and how to make our lessons better to help our instruction improve and the growth of our students improve. And that's where we'd like to bring in our coach, Jackie Abrams. <laughs> Hello. Um, so I'll just I'll speak quickly about the role of my role in this in this professional development. So as the ELS, the Elementary Literacy Specialist, um, the role was recently redefined so that I spend 50% of my day in a formal coaching mode, which means I'm in classrooms working with children and working with teachers on improving instruction. Um, and then the other 50% of the day is, is more just tasks and administrative duties that need to be done. What's been so great about this opportunity is that it's really authentic. So we get a lot of professional development here in Brockton. We're lucky. Um, but this was one, this has been a professional de development that really stands out to me. Um, it's allowed me to step in instead of being sort of an expert in a particular area, I've been able to be a learner right alongside classroom teachers, which really kind of creates a nice relationship and professional culture um, in the building. And for children especially, this has been nice because as teachers and as a coach, as we're learning, the, the instruction has really changed for children. Um, they're doing real reading and real writing while we're, we're always keeping the Common Core State Standards in our mind, but this has been a lens for us to allow children to really get what they need, but also what they want in terms of choice in selecting books. Um, and I think that um, we've been really lucky that all of the literacy experts in the district have been able to come and be a part of this, and we hope to be able to grow it within our building um, next year. <coughs> There's there. Mrs. Abrams there in I action. <laughs> you all set? You all set? Thank you, Principal and everybody. Does uh, any members of the committee, any questions? Mr. 
great job. Um, Thank you. Now, you said it's funded by Title II. Mm -hmm. Is it completely funded by Title II? I believe so. Okay. <laughs> That's good. Um, that was my main question, but I, I really like, I just finished my uh, master's in secondary. We did a lot of talk about reading lab and uh, this type of thing. And it's nice to see you being employed in the district. I think it's, it's a great tool. Ms. Sullivan. That they can have, I know, is great for the teachers to improve and that they wanted to do it. Oh, I am awesome. a, the luckiest principal in Brockton for sure to have such dedicated, wonderful teachers. They seem very dedicated. They are. Great. Thank great. Thanks. Mr. Mitchell, are you uh, looking for more books for, the, for your classes? <laughs> Always. <laughs> Always. <laughs> Always, Mr. Okay, I mean. Yes, please. <laughs> all right, I mean, yeah, that's good for us to know because, I mean, I can go through my boys' bookshelves and I can tell you right now there's a ton of stuff that, you know, is not age appropriate anymore. Mm -hmm. So, and I'm sure all of us in this room can certainly talk to our family. I mean, Joyce has nieces and I'm sure there's stuff at, you know, that at her niece's house that's no longer, you know, appropriate and Lisa certainly has books I'm sure from her kids I mean so um, I mean we could basically get the word out in terms of having a book drive um, you know a citywide book drive and we should probably put it on the website um, you know I'll talk to the superintendent about it when she gets back but I mean there's there should be no problem everyone can go through every, anyone with kids let's put it this way you know has outdated books you know Mr. Thomas has three girls I mean I'm gonna tell you right now he's got I'm sure a ton of books at his house I mean so so we can help out in terms of getting you some um, And something you should know too things. is the books that we do get as donations or that we get through donors choose or we, we teachers are buying themselves. As they clean out and they hand them off to students in Brockton, some of them are, have no books at home. So they're over the yeah. moon at any and all types of books okay. that are, so to us they may be outdated or not of interest that we want to use in Reader's Workshop, but to the children, um, there are many students who would love to take books home, so we're, we okay. can always use books. That's not a problem. Um, you know, again, very uh, good presentation. Um, we, um, you know, the, the school committee appreciates the teachers that we have here in Brockton. There's no doubt about it. We know the dedication and the effort you put in. Um, you know, if you can make it in Brockton, you can make it anywhere. You guys, you know, have uh, issues that no one else deals with. I mean, uh, Brett sees a lot in Boston, I'm sure, uh, but, you know, we have our, certainly our fair share in, in Brockton, and we, and we certainly know the effort that you put in, and we want to make sure you understand that we recognize that. Um, so, yeah, we'll help out. I mean, um, you know, the high school certainly uh, took literacy to new lengths and, you know, saw success with their literacy program years back and they continue at every ste uh, step of the way, you know, to incorporate literacy into, you know, physical education, health, uh, you know, every single course. So, I mean, we, we're glad to see things filtering down and, um, you know, we, we, again, we can help out with trying to get you some more resources. Um, just from our own homes, and we'll do our part. So. Thank you so Thank much. Thank you. I'd like to say that if anybody does want to bring in books that they have, because I can certainly do a lot of cleaning out at home myself, mm -hmm. um, and they want to bring it maybe to the next time we all get together, I'll deliver them to your school. Oh, so thank if anybody you so here much. at the table would like to do that, I'll, I'll bring them to thank you. you. Thank you. You're welcome. Thanks. Strategic plan. Are you? Yes. Yes. Thank you.
Good evening. I was asked this evening to do a brief update on the district strategic plan. And if you all know Michael, brief is def definitely the word. Um, one that covers where we started as well as our progress to date. So the district strategic plan started as a 10, 10 page document that captured the collective feedback of multiple stakeholders during Superintendent Smith's entry planning process. The stakeholders included Brockton, School, uh, Brockton Public Schools staff from a variety of areas, both past and present, members of the community at large, including business owners, civic leaders, and parents, school committee members, both past and present, and as well as the feedback from several listening tours, including a youth voice, which captured the concerns and hopes of our students. The original plan included 87 action steps, all of which fell into three main pillars, instructional excellence, supportive environment, and community engagement. We have maintained these three pillars and still have them today, and we define these areas as our broad goals. An initial challenge was to work with and prioritize the 87 action steps in a logical sequence over a multi-year period. Early on last year, the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education connected with us um, and talked to us about the U.S. Education Delivery Institute, otherwise known as EDI, um, because they had been working with DESE on a, a number of different initiatives. Um, the district support that EDI provided was actually funded by the Gates Foundation, so at the time it was offered at no cost to the Brockton Public Schools. EDI started with us and they did what they called a comprehensive district capacity review. This review involved teachers, administrators, community members, as well as members of the school committee at the time. The results of the capacity review suggested that with the institution of this comprehensive and ambitious district strategic plan, our next steps would benefit from EDI's framework or of planning, which they called delivery. EDI gave us in-person and virtual support to assist us with this planning. And as a result, we prioritized actions within the original plan, assigned ownership, and finally established a, a system of structured routines to hold us accountable to the plan. Our second challenge was to honor the inclusive process which resulted in the creation of the original plan. If we think about the superintendent's entry planning process, she involved a large number of stakeholders. We felt very strongly that the implementation of the plan needed to capture that inclusive process as well. We wanted the process to be strengthened by the input of school-based and district-based K-12 perspectives as well as the school community. EDI helped us with collective ownership and collective accountability through the institution of various structures and regular meeting dates that define our overall progress. And one thing to remember, though I am the one sitting in front of you tonight, the fulfillment of the district strategic plan involves a lot of people. Each of the three goals has an owner, and each strategy within each goal has a strategy owner. And goal owners and strategy owners meet to plan and report out every couple of weeks. Even beyond that, each strategy has what we call a strategy team. Strategy teams meet as needed to fulfill components of their plans. The composition and membership of each one of these groups is actually in that blue folder that you were provided earlier. But the key is we're talking about lots of people involved in the fulfillment of this plan. We have a couple of strategies under the instructional excellence pillar um, and we also have, I'll talk in broad strategies tonight, um, but you've been provided with the actual working documents for each plan so that you've got a level of detail if you're interested. The first strategy is collaborative culture, which focuses on the collaborative structures that we have in place to use data as a basis for improved instructional practice and decision making. The second strategy documents in our progress and pathway towards alignment of a, a uniform K-12 instruction and assessment system. That's a biggie. Uh, the goal there is to really think beyond alignment and think about it beyond K-5, 6, 8, and 9, 12 in all content areas and to think about a continuum that is K-12. The third strategy is student support and interventions, and that has an initial focus on the elementary grades with a focus on professional development and tools for struggling learners. 
The fourth strategy within instructional excellence is educator growth and development, and that documents our efforts in recruiting and developing educators in the Brockton Public Schools. Included in this strategy is how we maximize our own educator evaluation process to improve, promote, promote and improve continuous improvement. We also have strategies under supportive environment, and supportive environment focuses, focuses on our existing facilities and ways to keep them safe and secure for staff and students. Also within this goal, we address actions and training that support the emotional and behavioral well-being of our students. Our strategies in supportive environment cover a continuum, what we do for all students in the Brockton Public Schools to support them, and what we must do for some students in order for them to succeed in the school environment. As such, our alternative pathways are included in this goal, as these pathways serve as viable options for many of our students. Four items apply at each at each uh, level in terms of elementary, middle school, and high school? Well, one of the things that we do is we make sure that our strategy teams are comprised of people who are representative of all levels. So we've got school-based fo folks on each strategy team as well as district folks to inform the direction of the plan. So within each one of those areas, we've got a team that represents a cross-representation of folks K-12. So there are, so Okay, so it's it's a group from all of the different levels together, yes. or is it? It's not carp part. I cannot get that word out. Carpartmentalized. No. By, okay, each no. Rate, at each level. Okay. So when you actually look at the plans, one of the things that you'll see is there are specific uh, members listed under each each strategy, and that's done so that you can see that. What we really tried to do in every case was we took, looked at it and we said, who are the school-based people who represent this work, um, as well as the district-based folks who represent this work being done. Um, and at no time do we want to have a strategy team that's limited or heavy in one area and not the other. So that's one way that we represent K-12 in that way. And the EDI Institute, well, th that was the person that was here last yes. year from Washington, right? Yes. Is she from Washington? Yes. Yeah. Are they still are they still doing any follow up or are they, they they are not. We actually just heard from them this week that they're um, dismantling their system and they're looking to be absorbed by another uh, another entity, um, another nonprofit. Um, and you know. One of the things that I think we had said before um, was that we were originally sort of um, reluctant to get involved, um, but EDI was um, very, very straightforward from the start that it wouldn't, um, that their support, uh, virtual as, as well as in person, um, wouldn't cost the district anything, and um, that really what they wanted to do was develop some systems for us to build internal capacity. Sometimes when you're working with a consultant, you know, your relationship is contingent upon working with that consultant over a period of time. One of EDO, EDI's goals is to actually back out and to leave a system um, in a place where they've got enough internal capacity to fulfill their goals. So, did they so meet we your were expectation or they didn't. I'm sorry? Did they meet your expectations? Yeah, definitely. And okay. I felt like um you know, they change things on a dime, and you don't always get that either. If we wanted to um, change their role and change the way in which they were supporting us, they were very responsive to that. So Cuz at the time it was sort of a gamble. You don't know where it's going to go right. or if if it's worthwhile to involve them in the um, process, you know. And at the time, they actually wanted to get involved with Brockton specifically in regards to our educator evaluation process. Mm -hmm. And we said, you know what, we have this district strategic plan, which is very ambitious, and we need to find a way to actually implement it. So from the very start, we changed their purpose, and they were very supportive um, throughout the process. And where you have sort of the cross collaboration with the different grade levels, um, mm -hmm. I mean, I, I think it's a good thing in terms of you can, you know, learn from one another in terms of what's effective and, you know, have, you know, develop it, you know, the lower levels and, the, and you know, the higher levels, you know, what's working mm -hmm. at, at uh, you know, certain school venues and you know, any, I think any collaboration, like one of the teachers said that, you know, in Brockton there's a lot of um, support. Um, 
and professional development. I, I, you know, we need to try to get, you know, best teaching practices at all levels and incorporate um, those changes that are effective. That you know, I mean, we have I think some of you know the best people out there, and you know, we should be learning from each other at at, at every uh, point that we can. So, right. well, I'm glad it's working out. Yeah. So Sorry to interrupt. No, that's you. okay. <laughs> but I figured ask it while it's there instead yes, of yes, instead of back, having so. me back up. That's perfect. Um, so we have some strategies associated with community engagement, um, and that is our third goal within the plan. Community engagement focuses on both internal communication and external communication outside of the Brockton Public Schools. Some strategies include um, increased parent academy workshops to include bilingual interpretation, expansion of school community partnerships to be mutual beneficial so that our partners are receiving benefit and we are receiving benefit from working with our partners um, to continue to develop written parent resource materials as tools during parent conferences and parent meetings and also to redesign our uh, website with a launch date to be determined one of our most recent and vibrant community engagement strategies has been the Brockton Kids Count campaign and that campaign will actually live within um, this strategic plan As I indicated before, we meet to review our action steps and progress on a regular basis. One of the things that we're always looking for is we're looking for how we take something um, that may live at the district level and how we actually get it down to the classroom level. So we're always looking for those opportunities to connect the district strategic plan with everything else that we're doing. One of our um, one of our fo areas of focus is to, is to ensure alignment so that our district strategic plan is informing the professional development offerings that we're doing and that our district strategic plan is also informing the school-based school improvement plans that the schools develop um, on their own. So what you see there is you actually see one section of a school improvement plan. This is the Ashfield School, and I pulled the Ashfield School only because the Ashfield School represented, um, they actually presented to us a couple of weeks ago. And so you'll see that um, one of the things that Dr. Lovell talked about was that whole access to technology. What you'll see all the way to the left is you've got a district strategic initiative that is right within our district strategic plan. Um, you've got some school-based action steps that the schools develop on their own based on that district strategic initiative. And then you have the important questions about wh what are you monitoring, by whom, and how often. Um, what you'll see when you look at the school-based improvement plans is that they have areas of focus in instructional excellence, supportive environment, and community engagement. And the reason for that is we are mirroring um, what's in the district strategic plan so that we have that alignment. <coughs> So I mean, there are some fiscal and human resources that most certainly impact the fulfillment of the district strategic plan. Um, and as I said, I, I am here talking to you tonight, but we actually have many folks involved in the plan. And you've got some working documents, some working, um, working plans that I handed out this evening. Um, we will be um, revisiting our plans and looking at what our targets are and making some plans based on um, a new budget. And our hope is that just like schools are coming and presenting at school committee, we can actually take the opportunity to highlight the work that the strategy teams are doing within, um, within the plan itself. The, the district team meets every two weeks. Sometimes it's every three weeks. Um, first, thank you for putting the time in to prepare this yeah. and you're on your night. Um, just, you know, since we've obviously been discussing reduction of force, um, one of the things that I'm wondering is, do you have any kind of idea what the impact of the reduction of force that is coming to the the impact will be on the future? Um, 
It's hard to say. I mean, we definitely have some structures that we have eliminated or we're reconfiguring, and they were structures that we definitely relied on in the fulfillment of some of the strategies. One of the things that the district team will have to do is they will have to go back and look at what they projected to actually get done um, by the end of this year, by the start of next year, um, and think about not not you know whether those things are going to be abandoned per se, but are there others that we can enlist in supporting the work of the plan? Um, so I think it's probably a little early for that. I will tell you that we went through a process last year where we had some positions that were reconfigured, um, and it took us all summer to get them back, um, and back in the way that we felt was appropriate in alignment with the plan. Um, when people are in that state of flux, they're not actively pursuing and helping us to fulfill you know, that plan. So um, there are some things that we've had to back up a little bit, and there are some things that we've actually had to delay. Um, but that's the work of us meeting regularly and talking about the realities of that. Um, that's definitely one of those things that we can bring forward at a future school committee meeting once, once we've truly realized that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Your presentation. Looking over um, the strategic plans, one that I feel like we are really threatening with uh, the reduction in force slips that we passed out is strategies um, for supportive environment. Mm -hmm. Really, the best way to meet this strategic goal would be to have our teachers in a classroom. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I, I don't disagree with that. Yeah. I think that you you know the supportive environment is relying re reliant on that that caring adult and and multiple adults for students who really need that additional support. Um, so that will have to be something that we'll look at. Absolutely. Thank you. Um, you said at the beginning the district wasn't exactly sure about you know dealing with EDI. Mm -hmm. and there was some hesitation. Um, I know. A little bit about EDI. Okay. We, we use it a little bit in Boston, and it's a Gates-funded thing, which always right. makes me nervous because it's it's a very corporatized mm -hmm. type of uh, system. <coughs> um, so, what was the hesitation for? Because now you say that they're losing their funding, and I'm just yeah. wondering, you know, what 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 it, it makes it seem like EDI might have some issues. And I'm just wondering, you know, what the history there. Yeah, and I just got an email this week, and it was not exactly um, detailed, mm -hmm. but it was basically that some folks from EDI were being absorbed into another entity. Mm -hmm. um, as far as what was our hesitancy, um, if you know me, I'm always hesitant to work with a consultant. Um, mm -hmm. And the reason for that is because we really like to guide the work that we're doing. And sometimes when someone comes in, you lose that autonomy. That is really important. Um, and so that initial hesitancy um, definitely was diminished when they came in and said, we want to work with you on educator evaluation. And we said, no, nope, we really want to work on this plan. Um, you know, they, they, they backed up and, and, and really, I think, showed that they were going to um, support the work that we wanted. And the other thing that was appealing was, um, it was a short duration. It wasn't a multi-year kind of thing. And it was basically the um, organization said, we're going to support you until you have built that internal capacity, not we're going to support you so that you're reliant on that relationship. So there were just some things that they said and did um, that made us feel a little bit better about um, how genuine you know that connection they wanted it to be, and to be perfectly honest, they were not working with school districts at the time. Um, you know, there were they were districts coming on board with them, but their experience really had been within large organizations, um, and so they were looking to benefit from that work with school districts too. Okay. Um, so yeah, I think that initial hesitancy um, it, it really did go away the more that we worked with them, and. Um, not not an in-your-face kind of thing, like what do you need and, and how can we support you, but it was really defined by us, which is important. Yeah, because we do, we do a lot of things here internally, systems that have been developed well, and I think it's, it's, it, it, we do well because we develop them internally in, in the system. Mm -hmm. You know, it, there's a lot of teacher-led things that I think are great. So anything, anytime someone else comes in here, yeah. at least, because I see it in my own district that I work in, 
people coming in and out and then they, the, the things don't get finished that they're mm -hmm. consulting on and there are plans that the next year they're gone we don't know where they went um, so that that's that was my my uh, general feeling on that and then the school improvement plan um, are these school the school improvement plans they're individualized for each school yes um, and when teachers are setting their goals for their evaluations mm -hmm. and that's incorporated into their goal setting? Yeah, typically teachers are encouraged to look at their school-based plans mm -hmm. and to think about their own plans as they relate to school-based plans. And the reason why the school-based plans are gonna look different is because there's a structure in place where we say, look at your data, you know, your summative data as well as your formative data, yep. and talk about areas of improvement for your school. Okay. Um, but then connecting it back to the district strategic initiative, um, allows that alignment so that what we're offering for professional development, um, whether it's school-based or district-based, we're really supporting those plans as well. Okay. So that's worked out really well for us. All right, good. Thank you for that great report. And I've kind of seen the strategic plan grow yeah. over the last term. Mm -hmm. And um, I want to thank um, Liz Barry and all the team members for the tremendous amount of work that has gone into this. Yeah, and I should have counted all of us because there's lots of us involved, yeah. and the hope really would be that the next time we're here, you're getting a sense for really that collective group, um, school-based as well as district-based people. I'm just here tonight, but we're, it's, it's a large group of people who are really working on this plan. Good, anyone else? Thank you, Liz. Thank you. A vote on school choice. Earlier this evening at 6.30, we held a uh, public hearing on school choice. And so at this point, uh, for those of you that weren't here, I'll just let you know that the uh, school choice law contained in the Education Reform Act of 93 presumes that each school committee will admit non-resident students under the choice program unless there is a vote to the contrary by June 1st of each year, following a public hearing on the issue of whether or not to participate. That's the public hearing that was held earlier this evening at 6.30. Uh, last year, the school committee voted to continue the following program. Up to 50 seats will be available for inter-district students at Brockton High School, and up to 10 students in the Edison Academy. So at this point, after the hearing earlier, um, we can entertain a motion on school choice. Don't all speak up at once. Did you want me to read the Well, in essence, we just, we need for the school committee to decide if they want to continue the existing program, change it, opt completely out, opt completely in. That the Brockton Public Schools continue to participate in the school choice for the 2016-17 school year with the same criteria currently in place. Okay, that's a good motion. Second? Second. Mr. Gormley, all in favor? Approved unanimously. Thank you. Uh, at this point, any items to refer to subcommittee? Any member of the committee can put an item on the table and request that it be referred to one of our working subcommittees for further discussion and consideration. Superintendent's not here. That lightens the load on subcommittees a little bit. Um, well, seeing and hearing none, we'll move on. New business. Uh, are you going to handle this one, Mr. Medicello? So this is uh, uh, the May 10th Finance Subcommittee Report and Budget Recommendation. On May 10th at uh, 630 at the Arnone uh, Little Theater, the uh, Finance Subcommittee met and we had a further discussion of uh, the state of the budget, we were presented with um, different line items and um, came to the conclusion that uh, we would make uh, the recommendation um, uh, basically for non-net uh, with respect to transportation, um, the requested $8,985,636 uh, dollars and in net school spending um, we were going to adopt the mayor's um, favorable 
um, foundation amount that he provided us with for $167,396,656. Uh, we discussed at that meeting that um, uh, we were appreciative of the mayor for A, giving us the figure uh, ahead of time that ordinarily doesn't happen. And we also discussed that um, in the history of m me being on the school committee, I've never seen a mayor come up to foundation. Um, and obviously, Mayor Carpenter recognizes the situation that the schools are in. Uh, in light of the situation that he has on the city side because he doesn't have a, uh, uh, a clear picture on, on that end of things. But we did um, express our appreciation. Many of us on the school committee expressed our appreciation. So um, we also discussed that um, you know, as monies came in over the summer, we would be discussing different um, items, you know, positions naturally, programs, and that there would um, you know, be further discussion that, that, you know, the door is not closed in terms of where we're going to be, but we need to give uh, you some direction, obviously, to discuss with the City Council. Um, and we understand that, uh, you know, we're going to have to have conversation and schedule some meetings with regard to transportation as well, <coughs> as well um, because, you know, that's, that's an issue that still remains open. So, um, in a nutshell, that's basically what occurred on, uh, the in, on May 10th at the Finance Subcommittee meeting. So um, that being said, I would make a motion to accept the report of the May 10th Finance Subcommittee meeting. Okay, so the first motion is simply on accepting the report. The motion's been made. Do we have a second? Second by Mrs. Selvin. All in favor? The and the then the second motion would be to uh, approve the recommendation of the Finance Subcommittee to forward the school committee um, uh, proposed FY17 budget request of $167,396,656 in net school spending and $8,985,636 in non-net school spending uh, to the mayor for consideration in his budget preparation for FY17. Okay. Motion's been made and properly seconded. All in favor? Approved again. So. so. Thank you, Mr. Mitchell. And so it should be clear that that's not a final adoption of the final budget. That's a recommendation of the number so that we can include that in. So I can include it with the full city budget that will be submitted to the city council next Tuesday. Um, the formal budget is not approved until it goes through the city council, receives city council approval, and then comes back to you. Um, so there's, that's my way of saying that it's the budget is not final until it comes back to you from the city council. And then clearly, there's, there are moving pieces still here because we're cautiously optimistic that there is going to be additional funding from the state. But there's just no way to put a number on it. The Senate budget came out today. It's very encouraging. But it's not exactly the same as the House budget. So we know this thing is going to spend some time in conference committee. And then the conference committee is also going to have to be mindful of what the governor is willing to sign and not willing to sign. So you know, we probably won't know what that, initial, what that additional aid, if it does come, we, we won't have a number on that and know how it's constructed probably until early to mid-July. So, um, you know, this is an ongoing process. So, I mean, uh, the school administration, uh, the superintendent and her team will be continuing to work with the school committee in terms of, you know, reviewing the budget that we have to work with now. And then um, this will be a dynamic thing. So at some point uh, in the not too distant future, we're hoping there'll be additional funds from the state and then at that point, we'll see what it is and what form it's coming. And you know, we'll work to get it over to you and, and work with the school committee with a, an understanding as to where, at that point, the administration and the committee feels those additional funds would be best invested. So um, it's a difficult, complex, painful process. But it's where we are making progress. The mayor, the council, the school committee, you know, the superintendent, 
you know, we're all lobbying, we're talking to our delegation, we're, you know, we've had meetings with the Secretary of Education's office, the mayor, I'm sorry, the superintendent has been talking to uh, Mitchell Chester, the commissioner, um, you know, we're all, we're all pushing, you know, we have a, a great community who basically, you know, has embraced um, you know, our cause, uh, I mean, you can't drive down a street in Brockton and not see support for you know, education and the schools. But um, I mean, this has been a team effort and um, you know, everyone is trying to do their part in terms of trying to you know, lobby for adequate funding. I mean, we all know that what we have is not adequate. We're trying to do the best with what we have, but we have not given up. We are continuing to lobby and to try to get more funding. Um, and I know we're all doing that, you know, and you know, Mayor, I know you've been talking to the governor's office. You have a very good relationship with the lieutenant governor and uh, who has the governor's ear. So, um, you know, we just all need to continue pushing and, um, you know, trying to influence uh, Beacon Hill to do the right thing because we are one of the worst hit. There are 10 communities in the Commonwealth that got hit badly from this change in the formula. Um, and you know, we're, Brockton's hurting from it, you know, but we're not sitting idly by, so. So what we're dealing with issues specific to this year's budget, particularly the, in the governor's budget, the redefinition of low-income students. Uh, however, I think we're also dealing with just the um, fundamental underfunding of public education in gateway cities like Brockton. And the Chapter 70 formula has been insufficient for a number of years. It's political. There are more representatives from affluent suburbs than there are from gateway cities up on the hill. Um, so it's a challenge. And, um, but I think that in terms of the low income formula, the determination of your percentage of low income students, there clearly seems to be room for compromise on that for this year's budget, and that's why we're cautiously optimistic there'll be more funds. We just can't count on how much more yet. Um, the Senate did also address this issue of low-income student formula, but they did it in a different manner than the House, and that's why this is now going to need a little time in conference committee for them to get on the same page. And I, I did meet with the Lieutenant Governor last Friday, and the indications I'm getting from the administration is that they are not dug in on this redefinition of low-income students, particularly for this year, um, and that they're willing to work with the, with the Joint Budget Conference Committee of the House and Senate and hopefully come up with something that will help us for this year. Um, but I think we really have to be concerned about the long-term you know, we, we just have a fundamental operating deficit of $10 million a year, and it's been several years in a row now. And it's, it's because um, the cost of educating our 82 or 83% of students that qualify for free and reduced lunch and are living at or below the federal poverty level, uh, that those kids are more expensive on average to educate for us to provide them with the services that they need. We've got close to 600 kids in our school system that are classified as homeless and, and we embrace and love those kids, but they come with a whole set of challenges um, that require a lot of extra attention and thus extra expense. And you know, a third of the students in our school system are not proficient in reading and writing English. And we're getting them there as fast as we can, but it's also a challenge that requires additional resources. And we have a higher percentage of special ed kids with IEPs than the statewide average. And all of those cost additional money. And you know, these aren't the same challenges being faced by Cohasset and Situate. Um, and, and so the Chapter 70 formula has just got to be changed uh, in a manner to address some of these additional needs. And uh, you know, there's lots of ideas as to how to do it. Um, but there's certainly no consensus up on the Hill or with the administration. So you know, I think we'll continue to have our conversations about an equity and education lawsuit. Um, the city is 
fully funded, the city's obligation to local education is fully funded both for last year and this year. So I think there is a basis to file a suit for additional resources. And with a lot of other factors that did go into the thinking to send additional local funds over to the schools this year, besides the pressing need, I think that we weren't going to be able to make a very strong case unless we were fully funded a foundation budget. So in any event, I guess the message is that we've got some challenges. There are still moving parts to this. I think if you ask me where we are today compared to where we thought we were going to be three months ago, we're a heck of a lot better off than I thought where we were going to be three months ago. You know, are we happy about where we are? No. Do we have enough money? No. Are there difficult, painful cuts to be made? Yes. But it's not nearly as bad as we thought it was going to be. Um, we'll work our way through it like we always do. Um, we'll continue to provide our students with the highest quality public school education we can possibly offer. Um, and, and we will continue to work with what we hope will be some additional funding coming in and work with the superintendent and the school committee to um, be strategic as to about where we put those additional funds where they come in where they'll provide the most benefits to the system and students. So, you know, the work continues. Just because we adopted a number tonight, the work continues and the work will continue well into the summer. Okay. I didn't mean to go on and on. <coughs> you, um, you can tell I spend a little time thinking about this stuff. <laughs> Mr. D'Agostino. So, uh, as a matter of record keeping, I actually did not vote in favor of uh, the motion. Oh, I'm sorry. That's all right. I didn't see it. Not a problem. Did you just that. Was he the only one, or did he see I will, the problem? Either one. Okay. okay. And the question I had. I, I glanced. I, I apologize. I glanced. I didn't. See, I thought you didn't. Have. That's all right. So, so we'll have the record it? reflect that Mr. D'Agostino's vote is in the negative. And you've since addressed the question. I would have raised it anyway. So. say it would be impossible, but it would certainly gum up the works to a certain extent. I wouldn't want to take any of that. Thank you. Yep. Anyone else? How about under new business? Any other new business? Tom, you want to make a comment on the musical? I know you attended that. Um, if I don't quite, get your theater review, I'm going to be well, disappointed. Quite a so. variety of excellent singers and dancers. Um, um, sadly, this is my niece's last musical. She was one of the lead dancers and choreographers. And uh. um, so, Samantha Connor, we're going to miss you. Um, the singers were phenomenal. The dancing was great. I mean, there were so many good singers. I mean, it wasn't just a couple. I mean, there, were, there was a half a dozen at least that were great singers. Um, it doesn't surprise me about Brockton, but I just thought it was really nice. Um, I also attended with you um, and a couple of people here the um, dining out JROTC. Oh, I thought right. that I thought that was a phenomenal event. Um, I, I know Clark Lieutenant Colonel earlier. Clark was here he earlier, but um, that was a great event. And um, it's funny I ran into um, a gentleman who is in the Army National Guards and he's from Brockton and I said I mentioned to him that I went to the event and he said I was in JROTC I loved it yeah. um, and he's gonna use you know the GI Bill uh, yeah. in order to you know fund his education um, but it, that that event means so much to these students and it meant a lot to this this gentleman that I spoke with. He was he was only out for two years uh, out of Brockton High and um, it just goes to show you how it does mold character 
gives certain children, students, direction. And um, it, it's just a beneficial program. Um, the people, the, the students that spoke were so well spoken um, and just so mature. Um, yeah, I, I, I was, I'm really glad I attended that event. It was really special and they, it was just well, well done, all around well done. Yeah. Principal Walder was there. Principal, about how many students in JROTC now? 170 maybe? Two? 210. So 210 Brockton High School students mm. participating in the JROTC program. It's one of the best things we do. And they continue to win awards constantly in the state. It's one of the best programs in the state. Yep. And I, we have to go back and thank the school committee two years ago when the federal government shut down. They stopped paying the um, JROTC instructors across the country. And the school committee at the time picked up the salary of the the, the sergeant major to continue the program. Otherwise, it would have had to dismantle until the government was up and going. That was a good three or four months. That was our school. You're welcome, right? Yeah, Mr. Thank you. Mr. Was I on You're that welcome, one, Mr. Thomas. Was I on that one, Tom? Yeah, I think you were. Yeah. 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 No, it's a, it's a great program. You can't get rid of that program. It just is, is so much for so many kids. No, and it, people haven't been exposed to it. JROTC is leadership training. It's not really military training. It has a military component, but it's leadership training. It really develops leadership skills in young people. And uh, my grandson was graduated from it last year. And, you know, it's, it's just amazing what they do. And they, it's not just the time they spend in their JROTC class. Uh, the JROTC instructors really work with the whole person and they're very aware of grades in other classes, discipline, community service, athletics. They really look at developing the entire person during their career at uh, Brockton High School and they've got an incredible track record. Matter of fact, you know, as we find, figure money and we're not in a position to do it now, we really need another instructor because they're really at the limit as to how many students they can carry with just two instructors. They're above what the standard is. They put in so much time. Both yeah. Lieutenant Colonel and Sergeant Major put in a ton of time. Um, that was, you know, it was an imp impressive event. They do a great yeah. job. Anyone else? New yeah, business? Other oh, go right ahead. Yeah, I wanted to again thank the musical, the, everybody involved, the kids for all their hard work. Mr. Hogan, Mr. Cunningham, Mr. Macrina, Mr. Farrell Locke, uh, Sarah Richards, and all the volunteers. I know there's. Uh, dozens of volunteers that work hard getting donations and putting the whole thing together. So we thank all of them. Sure. The sets, the sets yeah. were out of control. They were so artistic, so well done, and the lighting and the curtain calls. I mean, it was so well coordinated. So all the you know the the kids that sort of did the back room stuff need a shout out as well. Amazing. They did a phenomenal job in addition to the dancers and singers. It, it was just at every level well done. No well done. And then a few announcements of, of upcoming events. Uh, this Thursday night the 19th we have the Broughton High School Senior Awards Night. That's in the auditorium. It's always a great ceremony. That's from 5.30 to 7.30 again thir this Thursday night. Um, this Thursday during the day at 12.30 we have the Huntington School Parade, annual parade. Um, Ms. Sabre McGuire, what, how many years now? 117. So that's this Thursday. And it, 118? 118. Perfect. That's, that's Thursday at 1230. The weather looks really good. So, And then the Pops Constant is um, next um, Wednesday, the 25th, in the Broughton High Auditorium. So that's the Pop Constant um, next Wednesday, the 25th, and that's at 7 o'clock. So those are the upcoming events for the rest of this week and next week. Thank you. And I'll apologize in advance for missing this coming Thursday's events. I've got an annual Massachusetts Mayor's Conference and I'll be out of town. So I think this will be my first year in quite a few years missing the Huntington Parade, at least 10. Um, but I'm sure that uh, I'm sure it'll be a huge success without me. Anyone else? OK. Entertain a motion to adjourn. It's not the most enthusiastic motion to adjourn we've ever had. All in favor?